Perhaps no subject in all of Scripture has created such interest as the mark of the beast. Yet at the same time, no other subject has had so many different interpretations. Many are asking the important question, what is the mark of the beast? There's some things we need to know, though, before we can answer that question, such as who is the beast? Tonight, Pastor Cox is going to identify the beast for you. He'll talk about the image of the beast and the number 666. And we're going to look at the mark of the beast. This topic is of vital importance, so let's go immediately to the crusade to join Pastor Kenneth Cox with tonight's presentation, The Mark of the Beast. Well, we're happy to welcome all of you back. I'd like to know how many there are that are here that wasn't here last night. Raise your hand. Uh-huh. Okay. We're happy to have you. Appreciate you being here. We hope you don't experience what we experienced last night. And uh, we'll get into the subject. Again, I'm going to say what I repeated last night. And for some of you, as we start in and begin, it'll be kind of a repeat for you. But if you're here tonight for the first time, uh, this subject is a heavy subject. It's not a light subject. And it takes a certain amount of biblical background to really grasp what it's talking about. And I'll do my very best to give you all the background I can give you, but I'll assure you that I can't give you as much as probably you need. So if you're here for the first time or you're here in the subject for the first time, please understand that you need probably a little more background than what normally you would have in just one sermon. A lot of people have asked, what is the mark of the beast? And people have thought all kinds of things have been the mark of the beast. You can pick up the paper from time to time and hear people referring to it and talking about different things that's the mark of the beast. My parents told me when they first came out with Social Security numbers, they said, don't take them. If you get a social security number, you're going to be getting the mark of the beast for sure. And when I was just a small boy, time in the Second World War, and they came out with rationing stamps, they said, don't take those things. You take those rationing stamps, you're going to get the mark of the beast. And I grew up in the state of Oklahoma, out in the country. Not too far from where we lived, about two miles, was a little town nobody hardly has ever heard of called Hartshorn, Hartshorn, Oklahoma. And in this little town was one grocery store owned by Mr. Long. And I can remember he decided to have a sale, a special sale. And he was going to give away a door prize. And so he had a lady sitting by at a chair there and a table. And everybody that came in the store, she stamped on the right hand. It upset the whole town. They thought they were getting the mark of the beast. So people have thought many different things about the mark of the beast. The Bible has some very clear, very concise, very pointed words about the mark of the beast. Now, I'd like for you to look at what it says about it in the book of Revelation. Revelation 14, verse 9. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. He's talking about people that receive the mark of the beast. <clears throat> he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence, and it, and it goes on, says, the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. So it says that those people that receive the mark of the beast are going to receive the wrath of God. Simply what it says. Those that receive the mark of the beast will receive the wrath of God. Now, it's important that you and I understand what it's talking about when it talks about the mark of the beast. And that's what we want to know tonight is what is the mark of the beast? I have lots of people that ask that question. What's the mark of the beast? I have a standard answer. And I ask them a question. And that is, I asked them, who is the beast? You see, you're not going to know what the mark of the beast is if you don't know who the beast is. And so it's important that we find out who the beast is, we find out what the number is, we find out what the mark is. That we're going to do tonight. 
We're going to look at all that. But I'd like to start out by saying that the mark of the beast is a religious question. Now, we hear a lot of different things, but the mark of the beast is a religious question. It is not a political question. It just is not. It's a religious question, and just because people are religious doesn't necessarily mean they're of God because it says very clearly here in Matthew, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Just because a person says, Lord, Lord, doesn't necessarily mean they're really a follower of God. In fact, the text gets much clearer than that. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonderful works in your name? Here's people who have prophesied. They've cast out demons. They've done all kinds of wonderful works. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, you see, it takes more than that. It takes more than just claiming to be religious. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, the mark of the beast is going to effect two things. You can put it down. As we go through it and come down to the end, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. But the mark of the beast involves, one, God's law. Two, faith. Those are the two things that are involved in the mark of the beast, and that's what we're going to look at. It is important that you know who the beast is. It's important that you know what the number 666 is all about. It's important that you know what the mark is because it says very clearly that you and I must understand it and we must be willing to walk by faith. If you don't have faith, then, dear friend, you're not going to get very far because it says it is impossible to please God without it. You've got to have faith to please God. These people that are going to make it into heaven, the people that are going to stand on the sea of glass and play the harps of God, the Scripture says this about them. I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass having the what? Harps of God. Therefore, if you're planning on getting into the kingdom, then you're going to have to get victory over the beast. You're going to have to get victory over his number. You're going to have to get victory over his mark. And if you don't know what it is, it's very hard to get victory over it. So we're going tonight to identify exactly what's involved here. Notice what it says in the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter in verse 1. It says, I stood on the sand of the sea saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns. On his heads the name of blasphemy. So it talks about this beast that is rising up out of the sea. Now it describes the beast. The beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. So it says that this beast of Revelation 13 is made up of the four beasts that you find in Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, there happens to be a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon, and this beast is made up of it. Now, listen as it describes what this beast is going to do. I saw one of his heads as if it had been wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled and followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the what? Okay, are you clear? It's a religious question. It's not a political question. It's a matter of worship. They worship the beast. They worship the dragon. This is a religious question, saying who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and authority was given to him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwelled in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one 
may buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Please notice it says it's the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. You see it says it's the number of his name. It's the number of a man. And his number is 666. Now we've read a number of scriptures. We're going to go back and take a look at each one and identify this beast's power. Okay? Listen to what it says here. And by the way, beast, like this one here in Revelation 13 and this one that we'll be talking about in Revelation 12, in Bible prophecy, beasts represent nations, powers, or systems. That's what they represent. And as I identify this beast's power, I want to tell you right now, I'm talking about a system. I'm talking about a power. I am not talking about individuals. Do you understand me? Please don't take what I say and apply it to individuals. I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about a system. I'm talking about a power. There will be many, many people within this system that are good Christian people. So don't apply it to individuals. All right, it says the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. This great red dragon that's talking about here is the great red dragon in Revelation, the 12th chapter. And you remember as we studied Revelation, the 12th chapter, there was a woman, there was a boy, a baby, and a red dragon. You remember we found out that that child, the boy that was born, was Christ. And it says that this great red dragon stood before that woman ready to devour the child as soon as it was born. And you remember the Christmas story well enough to make the application. For you remember when Jesus was born, it says there were some wise men that had made their way from the east. They had followed that star clear down to Jerusalem, and there they began to inquire about the Christ child. It upset the whole city, so much so that it says that Herod called them in and he asked them who they were looking for, and they said, we're looking for this child that's to be born a king. And it says that he called in the scribes and asked them, where's this child to be born? They said, oh, he's to be born in Bethlehem. And Herod told those wise men to go on down to Bethlehem, and when they had found the child, to come and tell him that he might go and worship him also. They went on down to Bethlehem. They found the child. They worshiped him. And then it says that an angel told them to go back another way because Herod sought the life of that child. Same angel told Joseph and Mary to flee. When Herod found out that he had not been told, it says he sent his soldiers down and had all the male children two years of age and under slain. This power that Herod used was the power of pagan Rome. This great red dragon in Bible prophecy represents pagan Rome, and it says that pagan Rome would give to papal Rome its power, its seat, and its great authority, and history tells us that's exactly what happened. For you find the pagan Roman Empire begin to fall apart in 476 A.D. Germanic people were moving down on the Roman Empire, breaking it up. The Emperor Justinian was fighting them, trying to stop that. The Goths, these Germanic people, had backed his army clear up to the walls of the city of Rome, and it looked like they were going to wipe Justinian's army out. The Bishop of Rome, his name was Verquillus. He was a man of God, good man. He would not enter into that battle, and every time Justinian and his army got close to the city or the Goths got close to the city, he shut the gates and would not let them in. So happened that Justinian's wife was a good Christian woman. She was a friend of Verquillus. And Justinian prevailed upon her to ask Verquillus to open the gates and to save his army, which he did out of respect to her. And he let Justinian's army in and closed the gates and kept the Goths out and saved them. But Justinian had already agreed with his general, Belsarius, that once he got inside the city, he would execute Verquillus, which he did. The reason? Justinian felt that if he could put his own puppet on the seat of the bishop, that he would be able to unite the kingdom back together. 
And so history says that the bishop of Rome stepped to the seat of Caesar and seized the scepter, the date 538 A.D., and you find that pagan Rome gave to papal Rome its power, its seat, and its great authority. Now, that's one point. We're going to move on very quickly. It says that this power has to be more than just some little power. It says that it has to be a world power. And power was given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And that's exactly what happened. For as the papal power grew, it held control for over a thousand years over nation after nation. I don't know if you've ever read about this German king who didn't like the taxation that was being placed on Germany by the papal power. And he told them, this German king wrote them and said, lower your taxation. And they wrote back and said, we won't do it. And then he said, I'm not going to pay it. And they said, if you don't pay it, we will excommunicate you. And he said, excommunicate me if you please. And they excommunicated him. They not only excommunicated him, they sent out word to the people and said, don't pay your taxes to the king. And the people cut the king off. That German king wound up standing for three days in the snow before he received an audience and was later accepted back into their good graces. They held absolute control. Now, let's continue on carefully. Notice what it says. It says an authority was given to him to continue 40 and 2 months. So it says that this beast power would continue for 42 months. Now, in Bible prophecy, a day simply represents a year. If you need scripture for that, Ezekiel 4, verse 6 says, I have appointed thee a day for a year. Numbers 14, 34 says, I have given you a day for a year. So a day represents a year in Bible prophecy. If we have 42 months... In a biblical month, there are 30 days. I multiply 30 times 42, and it gives me 1,260 days. Each day represents a year or 1,260 years. It says that this power would rule for 1,260 years. I told you that it came into power in the year 538 A.D. If I add 1,260 years to it, it takes me to 1798. Those years are known in secular history as the time of papal supremacy, if you want to read about it. 1,260 years. Let's continue on because the Bible becomes very, very clear in what it's having to say. And it says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been wounded to death. So it says that this beast power was going to receive a deadly wound. We get to the time of the 1700s. There's a man who wants to rule Europe. His name is Napoleon. Napoleon realizes that he cannot rule Europe unless he can break the back of the papal power. So, on November the 9th, 1798, he sent his general Berthier into Italy and he marched into Rome and took the Pope prisoner, 1798, just exactly as the Bible said, the 1260 years came to an end and it received a deadly wound. Now, you need to understand that when it received a deadly wound, a lot happened, folks. They took the Pope prisoner, took him back to France where he died in prison. They stripped him of all what was known as the Papal States. I don't know if you've ever read about the Papal States. But, I mean, they had huge portions of land like states in Europe they owned. They took all that away from them. This began a period in history known as the Roman question. I want you to listen very carefully because it figures in here very much. And it says here, and his deadly wound was healed. He received the deadly wound. November the 9th, 1798, it says the deadly wound would be healed. There were many, many efforts being made to try to heal this wound. 1798, 
all the way through the 1800s. In fact, they elected another pope. He came back and moved into the Vatican, but he didn't show his face for 50 years. There was effort made after effort to heal it, but every decision that was made was always dependent upon the Italian par parliament. The papal power would not accept that. Finally, we reach the 1900s. There's a man now in Italy that's no longer controlled by the Italian parliament. He's a dictator. His name is Mussolini. Mussolini decides that he will settle the Roman question. He sets up conferences with the papal power. And in 1939, he signed with them what was known as the Lateran Pact. 1939. What did it do? Let me tell you what it did. It gave them the Vatican. It gave them the right. Are you listening? It gave them the right to be a sovereign government. I'm not talking about a church. It gave them the right to be a sovereign government. It paid them $23 million for the spoilation of the papal states. It gave them the right, listen, it gave them the right to send ambassadors to every nation of the world and to receive ambassadors from every nation. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I'm not talking about what happened far as a church is concerned. I'm talking about what is happening far as a sovereign government is concerned. And you have enough that you ought to understand. You remember a few years ago? Huh? You remember Nixon? Do you remember Richard Nixon? Huh? You remember them? Okay. Well, if you remember, Richard Nixon decided that he was going to send an ambassador to the Vatican. He got so much mail and so many telegrams that he changed his mind. And so he sent his own personal envoy there in that of Henry Cabot Lodge. He went representing President Nixon. He served there all the time that Nixon was office, in office, and when Nixon resigned, Gerald Ford also retained Henry Cabot Lodge as his own personal representative to the Vatican. And then along came Jimmy Carter. You remember that? Now, I don't know how well you listened to Jimmy Carter's campaigning, but if you listen carefully to it, that was one of the points that he campaigned on is that he would send an ambassador to the Vatican. That was in his campaign speeches. And he was elected and then never did one thing about it. I mean, he was elected and you never heard another word about it. He sent his own personal representative in a lawyer from Miami. He represented President Carter all the time that Carter was in office. And then along came Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan didn't say one word about it during his campaign speeches. But when he got in office, he sent an ambassador to the Vatican. We have one. He accomplished it. Okay, what I'm trying to get across to you the deadly wound was healed. It gave back to them the right to be a sovereign government. And in just a few weeks, we will have the representative from there in our country. Did you ever stop and wonder what right he had to address the United Nations? The right he has is he's a sovereign government. He has that right to address the United Nations. So I hope you're understanding when it talks about the deadly wound being healed, this was healed. And it says, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. Now, we're going to have to move rather quickly, so I'm just going to read some statements to you. It says blasphemy. You know what blasphemy is? Well, if you read the Scripture, blasphemy is when a person attributes to himself the prerogatives of God. That's blasphemy. I'm going to read you some statements taken from a book called The Dignities and the Duties of the Priest. It's the handbook of the priest written by... St. Alphonsus de Liguori, and this is what it says. 
When St. Michael comes to a dying Christian who invokes his aid, the holy archangel can chase away the devils, but he cannot free his client from their chains until a priest comes to absolve him. Says the priest has more power than the archangel of heaven. Okay, let me read you another one. Thus the priest may in a certain manner be called the creator of his creator. Are you getting what that saying? It says that the priest can create God. Since by saying the words of consecration, he creates, as it were, Jesus in the sacrament by giving him a sacramental existence and produces him as a victim to be offered to the eternal Father. As in creating the world, it was sufficient for God to have said, let it be made, and it was created. Listen. So it's sufficient for the priest to say, hocus corpus meum, behold, the bread is no longer bread, but the body of Jesus Christ. Now, they say that when the priest blesses the bread and the wine, that it becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. Not symbolic, but actual. They say the priest has the power to create God. I could read you many more, but we must hurry on. It says, and it, was grant, and it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And all you have to do, if you don't want to believe what I'm saying, is go down here to the library. I'll name off a bunch of books for you to read, and I'll guarantee you, you'll see that's what happened. Go down to the library and read such books as The History of Europe by Qualbin. Read Fox Book of Martyrs. Read short, short stories of the Reformation. Read Here I Stand by Bainton. Read the history of the Reformation by Diabigny, and I'll guarantee you, you'll understand. This power, historians will tell you, has slain somewhere between 150 and 200 million people. All you got to do is read about the massacre of St. Bartholomew where she slew 60,000 Huguenots one Sunday morning. Read about the Spanish Inquisition or the Inquisition of the Dutch, the persecution of the Waldensian people. And when it says that this power would make war with the saints, she has done that. All right, all we're doing is identifying a power, a system. Now, I want you to stay very close with me now. Okay, all the points that we've listed here, listen to what he says. Here is wisdom. He said, if you want to understand, here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. We found out it was the number of his name, didn't we? That's what the other text said. It said it's the number of his name. And his number is 666. If all the points that we have found in Scripture are true, then this has to apply to the person who leads it, that of the Pope. His official name on his crown is vicarious phile dei. That's his official name in Latin. It means the vicar of the Son of God. Now, I'm going to share one of the strangest phenomena that I have ever seen in my life with you. I want to ask you a question. How many of you, when you went to school, were taught Roman numerals? Every one of you. Every place I have gone in the world, I've asked that, and everybody raises their hands. How many of you use it? Why would you be taught Roman numerals? Why? Because God intended for you to be able to do this. That's why. You see, because Roman numerals is simply where they have taken Latin letters and given them numerical value. That's what they are. You remember, a V is worth how much? Five. I is worth one. X is worth? Okay, L is worth? C is worth? Hundred. See, you know them. Okay, now let's take his name. His name in Latin 
And remember, the letters have numerical value, and let's see what happens. Vicarious, V is worth five, A ha is, excuse me, I is worth one, C is worth 100. A has no numerical value, R has no numerical value, I has the value of one. U is a modern letter. In old Latin, there is no view, U, there's only a V there. And if you have doubts about that, I'll tell you how you can solve your doubts real quick. Just get in your car and drive down here to one of these old county courthouses and see how they spell court. You won't find it spelled with a v, U, you'll find it spelled with a V. Okay, K carries the same value, 112, fill A, F has no nu numerical value, I1, L50 gives you 53, day E, D is worth 500, E no numerical value, I1, 501, you add them all up and it comes out 666. Six, six. Now you say, oh, Brother Cox, that's coincidental. No, it's not. No, it's not. You see, Hebrew, Hebrew letters have numerical value. So does Greek. And when you go out here tonight, we're going to give you a paper that has his name in Hebrew and Greek, and it still comes out 666. It's not coincidental. God said, here's wisdom. He said, I'm trying to tell you how you can identify the power. That's the purpose of the number is to identify the power. That's all we've done. Please, again, I'm talking about a system. I'm talking about a power. I'm not talking about individuals, not even the Pope. You understand me? Okay. Then let's see if we can establish what the mark of the beast is. I think before we establish what the mark of the beast is, we ought to clear the air and decide on some things that the mark of the beast is not. Because I find people trying to say this is the mark of the beast. To begin with, the mark of the beast is not the beast. Okay? We've identified the beast. The mark of the beast has to be something that the beast gives, okay? All right, secondly, the number 666 is not the mark of the beast. The number 666, we just found out, was given to help us identify the beast. That's the purpose of the number, is to identify it. It says the mark of the beast will be placed in the forehead or on the right hand. Please, friend, don't let people snow you. Don't let somebody tell you that somebody's going to come around with a branding iron or a laser beam and going to write something in your forehead. That's foolishness. Let's say that I love the Lord. Let's say that I worship the Lord and I follow. And let's say somebody holds me down and writes something in my forehead. Do you think that's going to change my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Not a bit. Don't let people tell you that kind of foolishness. When it says that it is placed in the forehead, the forehead is the seat of learning. It means that I give mental acceptance to it. It means that I go along with this. This is what I believe. That's how it's placed in the forehead. It also says that it's placed in the right hand. Why is it placed in the right hand? Because the right hand in Scripture represents cooperation. I may say, well, I don't believe that, I don't go along with that, but I'll cooperate. I'll put my hand to it. I agree to it. That's all you got to do is cooperate and receive it. That's why it's received on the right hand. You see, God won't take you that way. The devil will take you any way he can get you, okay? God wants your heart. He wants all of you. You can't say, well, I'll tell you what, Lord, I'll cooperate with you. He's not going to accept that. You're going to have to give him your heart. The devil will take you any way he can get you. So... See, also, the mark of the beast is not some little something that's going to happen over here in the corner. Don't believe that. It says here, and all the world marveled and followed the what? The beast. So it's not some little something that's going to happen. All right, let's establish what the mark of the beast is. Now, folks, I'm going to read you four scriptures, okay? I'm going to read you three to start with. One right after another. They're all just one, two, three. And when I'm through reading those three scriptures, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you answer me right, we'll progress. 
If you answer me wrong, I'm going to back the whole thing up and we're going to read those three verses again. And we'll read them until you answer right. And this is not a trick question. It's not trickery at all. I'm not trying to pull anything over you. I want you just to understand what those scriptures are saying. Okay? They're all found in Revelation, the 14th chapter. And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, I just want to ask you a simple question. Those three verses that I just read to you, are they talking about the people that received the mark of the beast? Boy, you aren't very sure. You want me to read them to you again? Huh? Are those three verses talking about people that received the mark of the beast? Yes, that's what they're talking about. It's making that clear that those people received the mark of the beast. All right, I read to you verses 9, 10, and 11. Let's read verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do these people receive the mark of the beast? No. In other words, John in the book of Revelation is contrasting those that receive the mark of the beast and those that don't. These people over here that do not receive the mark of the beast, okay, it says that they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Therefore, the mark of the beast must do something to the law of God and faith in Jesus Christ. You with me? Because if you keep God's law and you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're not going to get the mark of the beast. Are we, are we understanding one another? See, that's what he's saying. It's very clear. Those that receive the mark of the beast evidently have to do something that affects God's law and faith in Jesus Christ. Has the beast done anything that affects God's law? Well, let's take a look. Let's see if it affects the law of God in any way. Well, you see, this is what they say. I'm just going to read to you. I don't know how many of you have ever read a, a catechism. A catechism is a book that's put out by the church, and it's a book of doctrine. It's used to teach doctrine. If you've ever read a catechism, it's in question and answer form. I'm going to read you some pages from it. This is what they say. What is the third commandment? That's the question they ask. Answer. The third commandment is, remember thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. I mean, they say very clearly that they did it, and I can give you a lot of statements where they make that assertion that they changed it. They made a difference. In fact, they did away totally with the second commandment, moved the fourth commandment up to the third one, and divided the tenth one. So they definitely have done something that affects God's law. No question about that. It's very clear. Now, the question that I want to get across to you tonight is when did this happen? There was a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine who was a pagan. He wanted to make Christianity appealing to the pagans. Therefore, he took the day that the pagans worshipped on. They worshipped the sun. And he took their day and told everyone that they would no longer worship on the Sabbath. They would worship on Sunday, the day that the pagans worshipped on. And that change was made in 321 A.D. Ten years later, the church placed its blessing upon it. And that's where the change took place. Now, a lot of people say, well, 
How many people have the mark of the beast? Uh, do I have the mark of the beast? Well, I want to tell you, nobody has the mark of the beast at the present time. No one has the mark of the beast because there's certain things that have to develop first. You see, the Bible says very clearly that it has to be enforced by the state. It hasn't happened yet. Let me read you a couple scriptures. And he had power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both what? Speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast and so forth. Now, write it down. When you're reading Bible prophecy and it says speak and cause, speak means to legislate and cause means to enforce. It's exactly what it means, to speak and cause. One more text. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. You see, it's saying that he's going to enforce it. It has not been enforced, but the day is coming in which you're going to have compulsory Sunday observance. And I can tell you that day's coming quicker than most of you believe. Much quicker than most of you have any idea and which it will be enforced upon people. Now, it says that if you and I don't accept the mark of the beast, we would not be able to buy or sell, right? Now, that means that you're going to be boycotted, right? Huh? If you can't buy or sell, that means boycott. Well, did you understand that you can't boycott anybody as long as you have this stuff? Did you know that? You can't boycott somebody as long as they got money. Because if you can't buy it at the front of the shop, you can buy it at the back. It's always been true. There's been gray market, black market all the time. So you can't really boycott people as long as they got money. In order to do that, you've got to do away with this stuff. And we're not far from the day of it being done away with. I don't know if you've done any reading lately. You know, have you read anything about smart cards? Well, you ought to read about them, these things. They're making them now where they have memory in them. You see, all you got to do is just go. The day's coming where you'll just take this shopping. Won't need any money. Just take it shopping with you. And you'll buy what you want, and all your account will be carried right in that card. And all they'll have to do is just merely insert it, and it will... You will type in the amount and stuff at the machine there, and it will deduct it from your account. They even have them already made, where if you type in your number and you type it wrong, it will say, sorry, type in your number again, and you type in your number again, and if you type it in wrong again, they'll say, sorry, type it in again, and you type it in the third time wrong, and the card will destruct. So, I mean, they're a long way for this, and it's coming... But the, bu the bad thing about it is any day that happens, you better believe they can boycott you because they can just say, don't accept that number. And you've been boycotted. The economy, and I don't have time to get into the economy tonight, but the economy today is going to bring that about. Now, quickly, I must touch just two or three things in closing. It talks about the mark of the beast, but the scripture also talks about the seal of God. And it says that the seal of God is placed in our foreheads. Now, I want to identify very quickly what the seal of God is for you. Listen. And it says, I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their what? Foreheads. Do you think God's going to come down and tattoo something in your forehead? No. It means you give mental acceptance to it. Now, what is this seal of God? Let's see if we can clarify that real quick. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that what? Keep the commandments of God and have faith in Jesus. All right, so the commandments or the law is involved here. Now listen to what he says about the law. 
This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, say the Lord, says the Lord. I will put my law into their hearts and in their minds I will write it. You see, God's law is his seal. You don't, don't forget it. His law is his seal, and he says that he writes it in the mind of his people. So that's the reason the mark of the beast is involved in it. Secondly, it involves faith. How does faith come into it? Let me ask you, do you think you can be saved by works? Huh? You're sure of that? Okay, you didn't sound too sure. Come on, are you sure of that? Okay, no, you can't be saved by works. Now, any time an individual has ever tried to set up his own system, God has rejected that. When Cain brought a sacrifice that God said, bring a different sacrifice, and Cain brought a fruit and vegetables, God wouldn't accept it, right? Okay, when God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son, and he took Hagar and had a son by her, would God accept that? No. So God will not accept man's system. Now, dear friend, when you take a day that God did not bless, God did not hallow, God did not sanctify, and you set it up as another day of worship, you've got righteousness by works and not by faith. In other words, what I'm saying is that individual must be willing to walk with the Lord by faith. I accept what the Lord says. I walk with him by faith. That is necessary. That has to be in order for you and I to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Napoleon. Napoleon had taken his army and marched into Russia. As they were headed for Moscow, they were moving across the northern part of Russia, and in the northern part were great woods, timbers, and the people made their living off the wood, off the trees. And Napoleon had sent out a patrol, and they were going through that part of the country, and they came upon this woodsman cutting down a tree. The woodsmen there wore long flowing robes. This was their dress that they lived there. They took this man prisoner and took him back to a little house they were staying in. And they told him, said, Napoleon is taking Russia. It won't be long until all of Russia will belong to Napoleon. Why don't you become one of Napoleon's soldiers? And when the war's over, Napoleon will give you a large portion of land and you'll be a very wealthy man. And the woodsman said, no, I'm not Napoleon's man. I'm the czar's man. And they reasoned with that woodsman, but every time he would say, no, I'm not Napoleon's man, I'm the czar's man. And one of those soldiers picked up a piece of wire, bent that wire into the form of the letter N, and took it over and laid it in the fireplace. And they continued to reason with him, but they got nowhere. And finally that soldier took some tongs and went over and took that N out now, red hot and they held that woodsman's hand open and they said are you napoleon's man or the czar's man and he said i'm the czar's man and they took that red hot in and they branded it right into the palm of his hand those soldiers not watching what was going on the other hand of that woodsman had slipped up the back of his robe and with one swing he came out with a hatchet and he severed that hand from his arm and he said, no, I'm not Napoleon's man, I'm the czar's man. And I'm telling you tonight that God is looking for men and women that are willing to belong to the Lord. They're willing to say, listen, now I belong to Jesus. I'm his. I walk with him by faith. I follow what his word says. I belong to the Lord. I'm his child. I want you to listen tonight. Sylvia sings, Now I Belong to Jesus. Uh, tomorrow night, the subject is, what about modern prophets? What about people like Gene Dixon, Edgar Casey, Bridie Murphy, Ruth Montgomery? Are they prophets of God? How can I know whether a person is a prophet of God or not? What about the horoscope, the zodiac, 
What about the gift of prophecy? What about the nine gifts of the Spirit? What about those gifts? What does the Scripture have to say about those? That's what we're going to look at tomorrow night, an extremely important subject. So we hope that all of you can be here for that.